1 John 5 and 7. And this sounds real good, and I'm going to tell you something to you. Even though something sounds good in the Bible, if you're a teacher, leave it alone if it's not there in the original language. Just leave it alone. Just yes. don't, don't teach from that. Mm -hmm. That, that's, that's what they used to teach me in, in hermeneutics. Don't teach from something that's not there. I don't care how good it is. Don't be carried off with it. If we teach sense. God's Word. Yes, Brother Bill. On that verse there, you, you taught something like I'm having trouble remembering it, but I wrote down J.W. Jehovah's Witnesses? Jehovah's Witnesses, yes. Don't ever use First John 5 and, or First John 5 and 7 to, to uh, deal with Jehovah's Witnesses because that's where they, they use that to teach the Trinity so many times. The Trinity is, is, a, is a Bible doctrine. It's true. Tri the triune God is we believe in the triune God. But 1 John 5 and 7 doesn't really teach that as it does in King James, okay? Uh, read that Brother Mike, you've got that, I'm sure. I've got it in the New American Standard, but somebody, if they have a King James, should read it after. Oh, yeah, I'll read it. Some, has anybody got King James? Got oh, go ahead. King James. Yeah, which one is it? Uh, New King James or Old King James? I have the right one. King James. You got which one? I have the King James. Okay, go ahead and read that. First John 5 and 7. Yes. <clears throat> For there are three that bear the record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. All right. Now that's, uh, is that what it says in the original language now? No. Sure. What's it say in the original language? Somebody read New American Standard. All right. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is the truth. All right. That's all it says in the original language. Mm -hmm. All right. It just, it, it didn't say anything different. That was added much, much later. Somebody added that as an explanation of the triune God. If you read all of everything in there, he took part of the part, part from here and part from over here and put it together. Now, it doesn't do violence to the scriptures because we believe in the triune God, but it's not there. You can't take that and say, here, here's the Trinity. Now turn Mark the 16th chapter. Let me show you another thing. Okay, and if you look over there, and the, what's it say over there in yours, uh, in First John five and seven, brother? What's it say in your column? Now, I want you, you need to learn to read your columns because that's very important when you start studying the Bible. Look over in the columns. If you ever see a bracket of anything, find out why that bracket's there when you're going to teach from anything, especially if you're going to hear a preach, yep. preach from the Word, not something else. <laughs> see, that doesn't have a bracket because. It just wasn't there. Yes. What's it say over to the side? It, it, it just gives other scriptures to go to. Oh, okay. But in, is this the same? How it about King James? James? No, it doesn't. It's it doesn't have a bracket. How about yours, Bill? Does it have a and over there in the, in, in, in the middle layer someplace? No, no, no. I'm, I'm you know. Moved on to the back oh, okay. John, this okay, well, let's go over to Mark 16. I don't want to spend too much time on it because Mark 16 is another one like First John or like John. Uh, 8, 7, 53 through 8, 11. Mark 16, oh, okay. chapter. Yeah, mine, mine says that the New, new American set omits the words. Yes. Yeah. That verse up there, John, 1 John 5 and 7? Yes. It says uh, that the New American uh, omits the words from in heaven to on earth. Only four or five very late contain, contain these works in Greek. Oh, that's right. Only very late manuscripts contain that. Only four or five very late manu yes, yeah. manuscripts. See, that wasn't there. So when you're studying God's Word, and you're going to get ready to teach and preach from it, study, you want to understand how important languages are, and you're in a language of life. Mm -hmm. This is something you need before you ever teach God's Word. You need it. You need to learn. All right, Mark the 16th chapter, verse 9 on. Shouldn't be there. It's not there. <laughs> but it's there, isn't it? Now, what do you got back there, Michael? Are you, are you over in Mark, the 16th chapter? Yeah. Look down in verse 9. Look over at the side column. What's it say? Um, later, manuscripts add verses 9 20. All right. Some of the oldest manuscripts are basically what it should say. All of the old manuscripts omit verses 9 through 20. And if you are a Greek scholar and you learn the language, and, you, and by the time you go through the Gospel of Mark, because I translated Gospel of Mark, one of the first books I ever translated in the New Testament, one of the first Gospel I translated. When I translated the Gospel of Mark, I got familiar with Mark's writings. When you talk to somebody for six months, 
you got a friend, you talk to them for six months, and you understand what they talk about and what their philosophy of life is and everything else, and all of a sudden, you run into something that's just totally different. And somebody says, he said this. I know you. He couldn't have said that because he didn't believe that. When you're reading God, Mark's Gospel, and all of a sudden you go down there and you read Mark 16 and verse 8, and you go to verse 9, you find somebody else writing. It's not Mark, not, not the words Mark used. It is not the grammar Mark used. It is not the verbs that Mark uses. These are all different words, grammar, and vocabulary that Mark used every place else in his gospel. So you know something's wrong here. Did, did Peter write Second Peter? Did Peter write Second Peter? Yeah. Probably he wrote First and Second Peter. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, as we study the Bible and all that, some people, uh, there's one book that nobody knows who wrote it. That's the book of Peter. Mm -hmm. All right, nobody really knows for sure. I think maybe Apollos did it with with Paul's help, because Paul was was or Apollos was Paul's student. He baptized him. He was an Anabaptist, remember? He baptized Paulus again because he had his baptism was no good. All right, didn't have the authority of the New Testament church, and therefore he didn't have the gift of the Holy Spirit when he was baptized either. See, and he didn't understand that all things. He, you know, if you look at the Book of Acts and ran along there, and Paul baptized Apollos again, and then taught him more perfectly the way of God. All right. Because all he knew was John's baptism. Not that John's baptism, John the Baptist's baptism wasn't any really good, but some of his disciples that didn't have any authority, they went on baptizing after Jesus started, and John says, my time's over. It's time for him to go now. I did what I was supposed to do. And of course, they weren't ready to leave John the Baptist, say he was their prophet. And John says, my time's over. Go to Jesus. All right? Well, some of his disciples went on and baptized people and everything, and then they... they they, people were saved and things, but they didn't know, know the truth. But what was the name of the manuscripts they found? Uh, the three of the greatest manuscripts? Well, here not two. I mean, several years ago, they found all these manuscripts in uh, the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, the Dead sea scrolls. Yeah. Uh, don't they, can't you find that in, in there to find out exactly what... Well, see, the Dead Sea Scrolls had very little of the New Testament. Oh, it did. One was the Gospel of Mark, by the way. What was and it's the oldest portion of the Gospel of Mark we have in 924 <laughs> AD 70 when it was written, by the way. Yes. What? And 9 through 20 were not in the. No, no, no. 9 through, 9 through 20 were not in the original language. And if you look from Mark 16, verses 9 through 20, you're going to have some weird doctrines taught in there. <laughs> and some of it comes from the book from the book of Acts, by the mind. Um, why did you. In 920, um, in, in the Bible, when it's read lettering, that means Jesus talking. Yeah, yeah, it says Jesus talking, but really Jesus didn't say that. All right, this whole thing, it, it is quoting Jesus, but really, this is not genuine, so what it says there is not genuine. All right? All right, it's because it's red letter, it doesn't mean that. Jesus is really speaking in this way. And if you'll go through Mark 7, 53 through 8, 11, guess what? Is that in red letters? Yes, it is. Because that's supposed to be Jesus talking. Was this canonized? Uh, well, there's another thing. Who canonized the scriptures as we have them today? The Catholic Church. <laughs> So, Baptists were preaching along, and they, you know, we have the, those old manuscripts that we made up the Bible that we have today. Guess what? Who put them together? Baptists. We wouldn't have them at all. Those are the ones that they compare now, the scientific, uh, the, the people that study the scriptures. They were the old Baptist manuscripts that were copied, because they were the only ones preaching the Word of God back then, in, its, in the Greek. All right? So, guess where they were? They were really from New Testament churches and pastors in those churches that he had copied Brother uh, How many years after the death of Christ were the were the or the original Anabaptists able to preserve those Greek Greek writings that they taught from? Well, from two thousand five, uh, let's see. <laughs> so they they were able to preserve them even through the Dark Ages. September the, uh, what is it, is it the 14th today, 2005? All through the Dark Ages, they kept preaching the Word of God. God said in Matthew 16, 18, 
The gates of hell will not prevail against my church, nor the word of God. Now the devil did his job, but I'll tell you what, we have the scriptures today because of those people who stood for the truth because the Lord said that he wouldn't, he would never fail his church. All right. Do you have any other questions? We start, I started out 15 minutes early on, and I gave them questions, or time to ask questions, and that's what we were on. We went for 30 minutes instead of 15 minutes, but I think you learned something, didn't you? Now we're in Ephesians. All right. The book of Ephesians is not the book of Ephesians, is it? What is the book of Ephesians? To the churches? Well, it is a, a general epistle to the churches. The word in Ephesus. If you look there, where we start off in the book of Ephesians, the word in Ephesus was not added until much later. It was a general epistle. What does the general epistle mean? The general epistle means it's a general epistle. <laughs> in other words, a epistle, an epistle written to all the churches. All through, in other words, this letter was supposed to be written to every church. You just write your church name in there. Valley Baptist Church. Bakersfield, California. That's who this letter is written to. All right, because it was to be handed down and then it was to be written from now on. All right, Ephesians 2 and verse uh, 12. Let's go back to verse 2 because it's very important. We're talking, you know, we, we were going along, but we're talking about the glory of God, and guess what we're going to get in tonight? The sins of this world that enslaved you. All right, that's what we're going to talk about. We talk about the glory of God and how God uh, picked us out of eternity and placed us in his uh, uh, election box. <laughs> so to speak, we could have gone a long, lot further than that. And then in Ephesians, the second chapter, we start into the depths of hell. And we talk about the energy of Satan. The energy of Satan. In pace. All right. Uh, we're in 2-2. Two two. If you want to, oh, Michael, if you want to open up your your study guide that I wrote. And go to, go to Ephesians 2-2. Two two. We're going to read Greek. And then we're going to look at Greek, and we're going to look at every word. And we're in Ephesians 2 and 2. All right? Yeah. Ephesians 2 and 2. In, in haste, pote, peripate, sate, pata, cone, iona, to, cosmu, two, two, kata, tone, Arconta, Ace, Exusia, Iros, and then you can put the word two in there if you want to. All right. And then Numatos, two, Nin, and Ergontos, in, in, Tois, Wheels, Pace, Apatheos. This is some bad stuff. We covered a little bit of this last week. This here is scary. In which is, that's plural. It's talking about, if you go back in verse 1, it talks about how that we were all led astray by the God of this world. And we were all led astray by the lust of the flesh. You go back in Genesis, the third chapter, and you find out what they are. They were wants, greed, pride, and lust. That's what it is. Those things are what bind us away from God. That's what keeps us from being saved. And keeps us from serving the Lord, too. In which is, in which things, then, pote, peripatesate. Now, peri means around, and patio, that means the wall. And it's the second person, plural, first, heiress, and dignity active. Now, he's talking to this church here. He, he's talking... Uh, to them because this was a Gentile church. He starts out in verse 1 and he calls them you Gentiles. Okay? He moss instead of he mace. Alright? He talks about those Gentiles over there. You Gentiles over here. You were carried away by the God of this age, by the God of this world. And then he says, you walked up and down. Harry, you walked around. You're having a living. Don't you reacting? Something stop that to walk of life. Something stop that sin in your life. What stopped that sin in your life? 
Hmm? Salvation. <clears throat> when you're saved, God puts a different brain in your head. He does. He puts a different different thinker in your head. You've got a different thinker than you had before. You should have different desires. Things ought to just, your whole philosophy of life should change. Your whole habit of life. Out of the beaten path. That's what this means. You walk out of the, you were you were walking out of the beaten path besides the pathway. The Indians used to say, if, if an Indian went the wrong way, he says, you're not on the red road. <coughs> you're not on the red road. You're not acting like a, a true human being. <coughs> every human, every Indian, the name for that tribe was one of the human beings. Lakota, Dakota, Nakota. Those are three names for Sioux. Did you know that? Nakota, Dakota, Lakota. Those are all different uh, groups, groupings of the Suean tribes. Or, as they call themselves, the human beings. Mm. And when you didn't act like a human being, when you went the way of evil, you were on something besides the red road, because God had given you a road, a pathway to walk. And when you were off that red road, you were wrong. If you weren't a good mother, if you weren't a good father, if you weren't a good brother, if you weren't a good child, you were not on the red road. You were a bad boy, bad girl. You know what the worst thing in the world happened to the tribe was a man was so bad that, that, that if, if, if he was real bad, they banished him from the tribe. If he wasn't a good father, good mother, or whatever, he wouldn't support his family, whatever, they banished him from the tribe. If he was real bad, you know what happened to him? His father had to kill him. Because he brought him into the world. When you bring children in this world, God will hold you accountable to raise them right. I guarantee you. You will not get off of that. You are to walk the right path before your children. You're to walk, you're to teach them. When the Indians, if they didn't teach your children right, then the father had to kill them. If you had a woman that was out of order and was no good, she wouldn't take care of her children, you went out and you cut her throat. If she was just real bad, you were, she was banished from the tribe. She could never be part of those people again. Which was usually a slower death sentence. Yeah, it was a slower death. But if she was no good, her throat got cut by her own father because he brought her into the world. Does that tell you something? You know what? If you go back in the Bible days, the responsible party was the one that took care of us. All right, you walked around according to the Kata Tone Iona. Have you ever heard, well, this is just the product of the age? Have you heard of that term? Your product of the age? Well, there it is, people. There's the word age right there. There it is, Iona. Age. That's also the word for eternity. But here it's using the word age. Product of the age that we live in. You are a product of your time. We live in such a time that, that ungodliness is, is tolerated in God's churches. Fifty years ago, what's going on in God's churches today would have been absolute horror. But the world has been invited into the churches. And the churches act like the world. And Paul said... 2,000 years ago nearly, he said, don't let it be known among you. Don't let this happen. Don't let it happen. According to, you walked around according to the age. You're a product of the age, of the cosmos. The two cosmos. What does the word cosmos mean? You ever heard of the word cosmetics? As in cosmetics, what does the word cosmetics mean? What does a woman do when she uses cosmetics? She cannot leave the house until she sets her face in order. <laughs> it means order. Once you say that's not true, then you seem to drive down the road doing that. <laughs> I remember Brother Bass, he said his wife used to get in there and he said he had to put lights all over the bathroom for his wife to put her makeup on her face. And he said, I'll tell you what, when she took it off at night time, he said, Go in there like this, and I just hold it away from me, drop it. Dirty clothes, man. I didn't want to touch that stuff. 
Well, but John, don't tell him what's in that stuff. Mm -hmm. He said, get out there, and, and, and your eyes were getting bad when she got old, and he, and he had to put better lights on and, and get magnifying glasses where she could see and look at herself in the mirror and magnifying mirrors and everything else. He said, honey, she said, what am I going to do when I get too old to put the, the makeup on my face? He said, well, you're just going to have to walk out and let your face hang out like me. <laughs> <laughs> just look at the world like you are. He said, I've been looking at you like that all the time. He said, I, you haven't run me off yet. He said, the world ought to be able to see you like you really are, because he said, the Lord sees you through all that paint. <laughs> and I used to say it a long time ago, even an old barn looks good if you paint it. <laughs> paint it up a little bit. <clears throat> Cosmos, cosmetics. <laughs> The order is what it means. There is God's order and there is Satan's order. There are God's children and there are Satan's children. People. The order, this order, the age, this. According to the Archonta, Archonta, that means chief ruler. Who is the chief ruler in the, in the black world? The world of darkness. You know, as we, we look in the Bible, there's a, the, the children of light and the children of darkness. The black, so foam, thick darkness. Who is, the, who is he, Brother Bill? Satan. Satan. He's the ruler of the exousios. That means the authority to use power. What do you think holds people into the clutches of sin? Do you think it's their own desires? What makes people want to sin? The devil preying on their desire. It comes right straight from hell. You know what? When you're doing your own thing, you're not doing your own thing. You're doing Satan's thing. And you are a prisoner of his will. Mm -hmm. And you just think that you're doing your thing. You're not doing your thing. You're doing Satan's thing. And what was it? Lust. Lust for money, lust for fame, and lust for pleasure. That's it. And I'll tell you what, that's what's making the world go round today. Turn that ungodly boo tube on, as I call it. I can't hardly stand the thing. <laughs> that's all you see on there are those things. The ruler of the authority to Eros. Eros. What's the Eros? That's the air. The atmosphere around the earth. You know that this earth is absolutely baptized in sin. Immersed in sin. The spirit. Spirit. There's two, two, there, there, there are many spirits. There is the Spirit of God, and there are the spirits of, of demons, and there is the Spirit of Satan. And then it says, to me, the Spirit, the now energizing, and their gold toast. That's present participle active, genetic, singular, neuter. The Spirit, in other words, the word snumatos, that's a, that's, that is a neuter word. It's a neuter word in Greek. Spirit is a neuter word. So this word ergontes, who's, who's energizing these people and keeping them away from God, keeping them from serving God, keeping them from doing something with their lives? Who's doing it? Satan. Satan. He's the one energizing. we got to work energy. This, this propelling action comes from him and his imps. Next time you want to go do something bad, just think about where the energy is coming from. Better, next time you want to think something bad, just realize where the energy is coming from. In toys wheels. What's the word wheels mean? That means air. Air. H-E-I-R. Air. What's air? Someone by right of birth has something. The one energizing into the sons, the heirs of the apatheos. <coughs> it means 
not persuaded. It also means to bind away from. All right? But well, like you're going to find out if you want to study Greek and Hebrew, you can go on one verse and preach an hour. <laughs> you don't need anything else. There's a lot of energy in, in every verse from the Word of God. To bind away from. These people have bound themselves away from the grace of God. What can bind you away from the grace of God? The sins of this world. What are they in your life? Drinking? Whoremongering? Man chasing? Drugs? Money? Gambling? What is it that keeps you from going down the right path? What is it? What is it? Pride? Well, vainness. That's, that's all of the people. I've named them all. <laughs> I named every one of them. It's one of those things. One of those things. That's what's keeping you from going God's way. And it has got you. It's bound you up. The glue has glued you away from God. Good. And who did it? Who was the originator of it? Satan. He's the originator. It's not you. It's not what you want in your own life. It's Satan. 2 and verse 3. Here's another one. The depravity of man. Depravity. What in the world does that mean? The hopelessness of Adamic nature. I'm going to tell you something. There's hope. But not in anything that the humans can do. In Hoys, Hai, Humes, Hontes, Anestra Femen. Pote, in, Thais, Epithemios, Tais, Sarcos, Himon, Poyontes, Ta, Dinamata, Tais, Sarcos, Kai, Kon, Dinunion, Kai, Emetha, Hegna, Pise, Orgase, Holt, Sai, Poe, Lapoi. These are scary. You ever watch a scary movie? These are scary scriptures, people. These are the scary scriptures because, boy, this isn't. This is. There's no visual, what they call it today, special effects. This is the real thing, people. This is the real thing. What do they call reality television and all this reality? This is reality that we're studying here tonight. This isn't, this isn't make-believe. This is the real stuff. In witches, plural again. In witches, what witches? In sin, the depravity, the lust of our lives, the attraction of sin, also we. Now, Paul used ye earlier because he talked about all the Gentiles because of the Ephesian churches and all these churches in Asia and all over that these letters go out, most of them were Gentiles. He said, you all people were all bound away from God one time. You were all victims of Satan and his many, many little imps and his desires and the uh, lusts of this world and the False gods. False gods. I'm going to tell you what false religion can bind you away as much away from God as is sin. In which things? In dead stuff. You ever see a dog that goes out and he goes out and gets out of the yard and goes off and rolls and something he comes back and he says, Oh man, where have you been? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> stay away from me. You know what? That's what we smell like in the world. We stink like sin. A dog, you know, and pigs, you clean a pig up and it'll go roll right back in that stinking stuff. Coat himself real good with it. That's the way sin is in our lives. 
in the coombs and this dead ways of life, also we, Pontes, all of us, Gentile and Jews alike, anastrophemen. This is first person plural. We, secondary is indicative, active. We, at one time, we walked like this. This word here means to pace back and forth. It means to walk up and down. And it's, it's, it's passive voice, by the way, passive voice. What caused us to walk like we did? See. We are, uh, we inherit the sin nature from our fathers. No. <coughs> All right? And we, when we come to the age of accountability, we walk in the sin nature because of our own volition, our own personal Adamic sins our own personal Adamic selfishness. We conducted ourselves. We turned up and down. I remember one time I went back to Oklahoma. And I went to Fort Seal. And my grandfather said that he knew a man that lived there in Fort Seal one time and saw him when he lived back there. And he was drawnable. The grandfather was did your dad ever tell you about Geronimo? No. Geronimo. Do you know who, who was in Geronimo? Huh? He, he was a, an Apache. A chief. He was, a, he was actually a spiritual leader of, that, of those people. He was, he was a chief. He was a, a medicine man, basically, of those people. He was a war leader, too. He fought the U.S. Cavalry yeah. to a standstill of 35 Apaches. Yeah. With the U.S. the U.S. Army at that time, when your grandfather was alive, mm -hmm. for 35 Apaches. I'm sorry to believe in it. And the only way they whipped him, they didn't whip him. He surrendered, because they never whipped him. He surrendered. Okay. And the only way they got him surrendered, because they lied to him. <laughs> <laughs> They told him that he would have his own people and they'd have a place and everything else. Well, when they got him incarcerated, they hauled him off to Florida and then they hauled him off to Indian Territory in Fort Sill and they put him in a cell. This word means to walk up and down. And in that cell, I had been in that cell. My grandpa told me about that cell. You go and look. How many of you ever seen Geronimo's cell? Bill, you've seen Geronimo's cell where he was in Fort Sill, Oklahoma? Mm -hmm. Have you seen that book there? Right. That's not his real name, Jim. Huh? Geronimo is not his real name. Oh, no. His one who yawns was his name. Yep. That Geronimo, that's what the Spanish called him after he killed a few of them. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> they would start praying to St. Jerome. <coughs> whenever he would show up, they'd start praying to St. Jerome, and that's how he got the name Geronimo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the one we were talking about a while ago, wasn't it? Yeah. Jerome. All right. Uh, Geronimo, when they put him in that cell, you know the, the Apaches did not ride horses very much. Did you know that? Every Apache boy, when he was five years old, he had to run five miles with a, a, a cup of water, a, a, or I mean a cup of water, a little gourd full of water in his mouth, and when he ran that five miles, he had to spit that water back out in that gourd when he was five years old. By the time he was 12 years old, he had to be able to run 50 miles and spit that water out. By the time he was 12 years old, he was also expected to run 100 miles a day over hill and dale without stopping. Apaches did not depend on horses. They were the greatest runners in the world. No one could out outrun or out or outfight an Apache because of their physical ability on foot. They used horses all right. They called it portable food. <laughs> they jump on a horse and ride it until it fell over, and then they eat it. <laughs> That's what they use horses for. They didn't get, they didn't have much respect for horses. All the movies you'll see almost they got the, all these these Apaches riding the horses. But I'm gonna tell you something. When they fall, they were on foot because they wasn't a horse alive in the state of Apache. Geronimo, when they put him in that cell, he was used to running. He had to never give up. That was a cement floor in that prison for the cutting, and he walked a trail in that cement floor. There's a path about this deep in that floor where he walked in. Walking up and down, back and forth and back and forth. My grandfather told me about that, and I once saw it with my own eyes. Mark, have you ever seen that? I haven't seen that. They got his guns and his, and his bow in there and everything in that cell now where you can go see that. 
walking up and down. We conducted ourselves, our habit of living, walking up and down and back and forth. Then in the epithemios, this epithemios, that word epi means upon, doesn't it? And themios means, uh, we get a word thermos from it. So just think about thermos. What does thermos do, Brother Bill? Something hot or cold, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, that's what a thermos does. It's real insulated. Now, what the idea here is, the themios, it is a desire. What desire keeps you away from God? You. What desire keeps you away from God? Sin. What is it? You sin, but which one? Which one is bothering you? Which one has control of your life? Which one is it? That's the one we're talking about tonight. And then you put the female there, the thermos, that keeps it hot or cold. All right? That's what the word thermos is. Then you put an epi on top of it. What are you doing with this epi? When you put something on top of a word in Greek, what does it do? It intensifies that word. <clears throat> All right, that's what it is. It intensifies that word. Epithemios. Our passions, our lusts, our desires. In taste, epithemios. It's talked about plural now. Taste, sarcos. The word sarcos comes from the word sarch. Okay? Have you ever prayed to God and said, God, I just can't help it? I was watching a movie yesterday. It was a silent movie. And uh, what well, wasn't either. It was in German, I guess. Listen to it. It was a real old movie, 1920-something. This uh, girl's father had come home. He, he went out and got drunk. And he carried him a bucket of liquor for him. Set it on the table. And he said, oh, God, please help me. I don't want to ever touch another drop. Oh, and he told his daughter, oh, I got a headache so bad. This terrible demon liquor. And he held his head like that. And he said, I got to go lay down. I'm so sick. He looks over there and he gets his pay on the taste of it. Takes that pail with him. To the bedroom. Pail of liquor. Never want to take another drop. Oh, yeah. Sin will do that to you. Until you get tired of it. Until you get tired of it. <coughs> Taste sarcos. I want you to remember this. John 1, 14 says, Kai holo go sarks again to. Kai holo go sarks again to. What in the world did I just say? Kai and ho the logos word. Who is the word? Jesus. Who was really the word? Jehovah, Jehovah God. All right. And the Jehovah sarks flesh again to. He became. God became flesh so he could redeem you from this epithemos. He could redeem you from the terrible, sinful flesh that we live in. The flesh of us. And he's talking, that's, that's uh, genitive plural. Right, genitive plural. Second person poem. You got singular down here. It should be plural. Put down there, plural. And I told you I made mistakes. <laughs> what should be plural? Genitive plural. Yeah. yeah. Second person pronoun. Or sarcos? Oh, uh, second, first person pronoun. Genitive plural, first person pronoun. What is that? Constant. Yeah. Hey, mall. Yeah. Sarks. Hey, mall. Yeah. Sometimes I have to correct myself. Mm -hmm. Poyontes. Poyontes. That comes from poem. Our word poem comes from this. It comes from poyo. Poem, what do you do? In a poem, you make words rhyme, don't you? All right. Poetry. That's where our word poetry comes from. And it, this word here, it means this present part of the nominative, plural, masculine, and it means constantly doing something. 
Kosan do doing Ta Thilamata. Say the word Thilamata. I like it in, in, in Ephesians, the first chapter, it talks about the Thilamata Thiu. To the, the spiritual activating force of God. What caused him to love us? What caused him to call us? What caused him to come down from heaven in the flesh and become part of the human race so he could redeem us? The Thelemata there. But now it talks about the Thelemata, the spiritual activating force that energized you to hold you away from God, to keep you persuaded away from the things of God. What kept you from doing the things of God? Is that accusing you? Plural or? I'm doing accusing plural, yes. Yeah. Doing the wills, by the way, that, that it, it is will, spiritual activating force. I've got down a fleshly activating force. But it comes from fellow, which means I wish or will, and it's a wishing. Alright? <coughs> and of course we know that this wishing comes from the wrong kind of spirit stuff. What keeps you doing the things that you do? The spirit of evil. The spirit of your flesh. The spiritual activating force. The satanic activating force. Taste sarcos. Of the flesh. Right? Adam was in the garden. What is the word garden? What does that mean? By the way, that should be the word paradise. You know what the word paradise means? It means a guarded flesh of heart. Now who was supposed to be guarding the garden? Adam. All right? And this word Eden, what does that mean? Earth. Earth. All right. He was in this garden in the earth. In the eastern part of the earth. Somewhere over there between the Euphrates and the uh, Tigris River. Somewhere over there. What we call the Fertile Crescent. Some place over there was the Garden of Eden, the Garden of the Earth, that God had planted and put God put man over it. When God put him in that garden, he had everything he needed in this world. He had no desire or anything that he didn't have. He had the most beautiful <coughs> woman that God gave her to. Him. That's what you call a special tailor made woman for you, brother David. <laughs> tailor made! The, that was the apple of his eye, so to speak. He was. Really, brother. Now, we know where your apple of your eye is. We know who it is, don't we, Joanne? His tailor made. I, I, brother, you wouldn't have made the choice different than what you did. I know that you're surrounded by women. You're surrounded. <laughs> but he was surrounded by a woman that he loved. A tailor-made woman that came from him out of him. All right, and this beautiful garden that God had planted, needing nothing. And what happened? What did Adam do? He didn't do nothing. <laughs> 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 I had a terrible answer. Go on. He was watching football on television when he was supposed to be gardening. What? That's what you're supposed to be doing. I'll oh, probably. <laughs> Knowing the rest of the human race today are watching hockey or something. Or I don't want to. But he was doing something, so I wonder what the next one He was doing something he wasn't supposed to be doing. God told him to guard it, and he didn't do it. He fell, and he infected all of his children. I'm going to tell you what. Where's the first time anybody ever committed suicide in the Bible? Adam. Adam. That man committed suicide. God made spirit, spirit. Spirit. He not only committed suicide, he doomed his whole race. Now Eve, she was deceived, wasn't she? But what did Adam do? He knowingly, eyes wide open, committed suicide. You know, I never, never realized that until now that the original sin was not the, was not the act of eating the fruit. It was the act of him not guarding what he was told to guard. Well, then he, and he willingly, wise, wide open, took that fruit right. and ate it. 
knowing exactly what was going to happen. His wife had already eaten. She was deceived, but Adam was not deceived. Adam committed suicide. He absolutely killed himself. Not only did he kill himself, he killed the whole human race in doing that. Man, what a mess. Now the second Adam. That was the first Adam, the failure. The second Adam. Think about Jesus now. Jehovah. And the word in Jehovah, flesh he became, and dwelt among us, and we saw the glory of God as no man had ever seen God. The only begotten God that ever came into the world. We see how long the second Adam come in. Where was Jesus tempted the first time? Where was he tempted? Adam was tempted in the garden, in the pleasure park, in paradise. Where was Jesus tempted to begin with? When the devil took him up on the mountain. Boy, the Where'd he go? Out in the wilderness. How long was he out there? Forty days. Did he have anything to eat? Did he have anything to drink for forty days? What was he doing? Communing with animals. That was all. Communing with animals. He wasn't eating them either. He was communing with them, just like Adam did in the garden. Did you know that? When Jesus dealt with animals, it's like Adam did in the garden. They all obeyed him. They didn't get him in trouble. Animals never gave God any trouble. Man gave God trouble. Not animals. Not animals. He was out there in the wilderness. And rainbows, the high means of desolate wilderness. How many of you ever watched the movie uh, for that horse in it? The name of the horse? Hill Dog. Hill, Hill Dog. Hill Dog. Hill Dog. That movie Hill Dog. Where they are out there in the desert where there wasn't anything to eat. That's where Jesus was out in the desert like that. This is the wilderness. This is the place where no vegetation or life can be found. And here comes, now, Adam's in the garden, in the perfect garden, paradise on earth, that's what it was, because God planted it. Garden pleasure park, that's what the word paradise means. He was in that paradise, and what was Jesus? What he was dead. In the wilderness. No comforts whatsoever. Nothing to eat. Adam had everything he wanted to eat, everything he wanted to drink. Companionship. What was what was uh, Jesus says that the Son of Man came into the world, the creation itself accepted him, but not the, the creature, not mankind. Those creatures out in the wilderness accepted Jesus for who he was, but mankind didn't. The first thing that happened when Jesus was out there and he said he was hungry. You ever been real hungry? I don't mean you went six hours without eating. <coughs> Two or three days without eating? Four days? How many of you ever had to have one of them colon scopes? <laughs> this will test you just a little bit. Drink all you want to drink. Well, just think about it without drinking. All right? Sorry about that, brother. <laughs> Thank you for that bit of information. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, when I first had one of them the first time, I had to go without eating five days. Five days. That doctor, the man, that was Dr. Bogle when he first got started. Boy, oh, what fool he was. Man. Boy, five days without eating. I was about to die. My blood sugar went down to 20. I wouldn't have blood testing. And they called me back from that lab. They said, man, go to your doctor. You don't have any blood sugar. I said, well, I haven't eaten in days. Well, he was out there for 40 days without eating. And then the devil came to him, and what did the devil say, Brother Bill? You hungry, old boy? All you have to do is make those stones into bread, and you can have them. He didn't do it, did he? <coughs> Everything and every way that Jesus was tempted in that paradise, Jesus was tempted in terrible conditions. But Jesus overcame because there's God in the flesh. That's the difference between us. You know, we can't save ourselves. But once God has saved us, don't tell me you can't do God's will. Because now you have the power of the Mata of God in you to tell you the right direction to go. I guarantee you, every time you do something evil, 
if God is not there in conscience telling you you are going the wrong way, then you better go back and figure out if you're saved or not. Because God's Spirit does that. Is that right, Mother Dan? Yes, it is. If you go, you're not going to sin and be happy. You're not going to do it. Of the flesh and of the dionion. Dionion. What's that word, dionion? Noose is what it comes from. Noose. That's one of the five words for mind. Actually, one of the six words, if you want to ask the fellow in there. And it's got dia on the front of it. What in the world does dia mean? A little preposition it means through, doesn't it? So, this means the depths of your mind. The depths, the thoughts of your mind. The deep down purposes that make you, that which makes you tick. Everybody ever say, what in the world makes you tick anyway? That's it. That's, the, that's what makes you tick. The mind are the faculties of understanding, feeling, and desiring, and wanting and willing. That's what it comes from. And ametha. The word ametha there. It means we kept on being. We kept on being. And then we have the word techno. The word techno. What the word is techno? Remember the word I told you that Jesus was a... Uh, <coughs> The word technician comes from? This is the word the technician comes from. When Adam and Eve had a baby, Eve says, look what we made. We have gotten a man, even the Lord, the Messiah. We made him. We got him. We made him according to our pattern. He's got two eyes, two feet, two ears, two hands, two arms, two legs. He looks just like us. We made him just like this. The word techno means offspring. It means a child. Something that you made. <coughs> something that's made by the father and the mother. That's what a techno is. Techno. Technology. Put the, put, puts little the children on the floor. Technology. All right. That's where we get the word. It means a born offspring. Ye kept on being offspring, fise. Look at that word, fise. That means by nature. The basis of nature. You know what the basis of nature is? Grabbing and stealing and wanting. You know that? Grabbing, stealing, and wanting. That's the base nature of man. Want, 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 want. That's what makes gambling so bad. That's what makes cheating so bad. That's what makes defrauding so bad. This is the basis nature that a human being can have. A base nature. A base nature. How many of you ever tried to civilize a cat? Huh? <coughs> my, my friends, uh, my, my wife's got a friend that uh, she's a wonderful person. And she's a vegetarian, she doesn't eat anything, and she's got cats and dogs and everything, and she teaches her cats and dogs not to kill anything else. I'm going to tell you something, it's a real challenge to teach your cat not to kill something. You know what its nature is? Is to kill. What is the nature of, of many animals out in the wild? To kill and be killed today, ever since they got off of that ark. They didn't do this before, but ever since they got off of that ark with Noah, they've been killing and being killed. They've got these nature programs on uh, National Geographic and stuff, and they're always seeing some leopard or some lion or something kill something else, some other creature. Killing. Killing and being killed. And you go out in the ocean, catch a fish. Brother Bill told me a story about it. He, he loves to go deep sea fishing. <laughs> <laughs> he said he went one time and he said he never wanted to go again. That was enough for him. He started to swim ashore. If he started swimming ashore, he might have been bait, Brother Bill. <laughs> it was your father in law that held you back. I didn't know he was slipping up getting my jacket from behind. When I got quiet, I knew I was going over the edge of that boat. 
He looked over and he saw a shore and he was going to swim back. He wasn't going to stay out there. He's seasick. Hey, he never goes anywhere. But I'll tell you yeah. what, out there in that ocean, all you are when you're on a life jacket or something, all you are is, is bait. That's it, you're bait. I've known people that have been out in the ocean all their lives and, 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 and they're uh, captains of ships and everything else. They say, I ain't getting in that water. <laughs> you get in that water, you want to. I ain't getting in that water. You're bait. That brother right there, <laughs> you know all about that, don't you? He does. He's a diver. What do those fish do down there under, under that water, brother? They look up for <laughs> something to eat. Yeah. All they think about is what? Eating. Eat. I don't know how anything ever gets mature. Yeah. They kill each other all the time. Margarita. I watched the Discovery Channel yesterday, and it's showing that the sand shark went inside the womb when, when the first one developed. Eat all the rest of them that's not felt, and it's the strongest one that comes out, the strongest of the lid. Well, they're even more. While they're it's still inside, it, it's already, already killing. Eating the other litter. Already killing. You go out there, I remember this a long time ago. I went out in the ocean. I went out 20 miles out in the ocean, a little 14 and a half foot boat. I didn't have much sense back then. But when they didn't have buoys out there. You just kept on following the buoys. And one, two, three, four. On a mere mile out there, you just kept going and going to go back. You just started going backwards. And that's when they had the big ships coming, Navalin over there. And they had these buoys out there telling how far it was to shore. I went out there 20 miles. We were out there catching fish this right and left. And my oldest boy, of course, he wasn't very old then, he, he goes over and he catches. We were into these blues. They're like a perch looking thing about this big and about that wide. And he caught these blues and he pulled it up and all of a sudden he went, Rrr! Boy, I mean, he's pulled this and been over double like this. He pulls the thing up and throws it up on the back of the boat and there's a great big lean cod on the back of it. He's eating the blues. Mm. He's got the blue, he's what's it called, a pitch rocker. Mm. He's got his mouth on this blue. Mm. Blue weighs about five pounds. Well, this is a big old lean top. He pulls it in and he lets it settle on the back of the boat back there. There's a big thing in the back where the motor was. And he looks at it and he says, Dad, what is that thing? He says, Get it in here. Before I knew it, he threw it back out there. Oh, he wasn't going to let He said, What is that thing? Anyway? He said, You see this mouth? <laughs> His mouth was full of teeth about that long, boy, like needles. He wasn't going to get too close to that thing. Well, when it turned loose, it left teeth prints on that blue. He took that blue in and had this half moon mark all the way around it, where he grabbed a hold of it. That's nature. That's sea set. Orgays. You ever hear the word orgy? That's where people just turn their lust plum loose. Well, I'm gonna tell you something. God's gonna turn His hate on that one of these days. That's the word orgays. Wrath. Pulse. Even as, or just as, also, the point, the ones, the point, the ones remaining in the clutches of Satan. Godlessness. Worldliness. Ungodly buzzards. We were all those, weren't we? We were all those kind of people. What kept, kept us into the clutches of Satan? It wasn't what you really wanted. What, it wasn't really your desire, it was it? It was your father. Your father, the devil. Oh. You got one or two fathers in this world. You either got Satan or you got God. There's, I mean, that's it. There's old, that's it. A child, when he comes up and he grows up, a little child, until he comes up to the age of accountability, he's saved. But there's going to be a time that he chooses which way to go. That's right. Child chooses which way to go. And when he does that, that's when he becomes dead or alive. That's right. Because you're either a born son, you're a techna of Satan, and you're a techna of God. You call them heirs. Heirs. What is heir? What's the first Satan's abode going to be? Where is this final abode going to be? The lake of fire. The lake of fire. Where is all of his children going to be? Right there with him. 
Now, where's heaven? That's above. That's going to be in the abode of God. In it. And all the universe, by the way, God's going to cleanse the whole universe. And His children are going to be all over the universe on vacation. <laughs> vacation in glory. Forever. I own him. I own, I own, I own. Forever and ever. Ages upon the ages. You're going to be in one of those two places. It all depends upon you. What you do with that being a mock. With that, with that desire. You're going to give that over? You're going to follow the Lord and ask Him to save your soul and forgive your sins and lead you in your life and, and glorify God. That's what all this whole second chapter is about. It's talked about the way of death and the way of life. And by the way, nothing you ever do in this world when you're saved ever comes from the flesh. It's the Spirit of God working in you. It's just like nothing you ever do that you think you're doing your own thing. You're not doing your own thing. You're doing Satan's thing. He's the one energizing you. That's where energy out. Well, I hope you learned something from God's Word tonight. We only have to cover a couple of verses. But this is so rich. I was studying today as I was eating breakfast. And I kept looking up. And I said, oh, you ought to see this, Marilyn. You're going to get to hear it tonight. <laughs> she said, tell me what it is. I said, no, that's only free news. And come make a track. Just look over here. <laughs> you get to hear it just like the rest of them do. We're going to get into real good stuff. Two, four, five, six, seven, two, and eight. You hear one of the most, one of the most quoted verses from the Bible, Ephesians 2 8. For by grace, I don't want to say it anymore. You are saved. For in grace, it says, you are having been saved through faith. And that faith let him come from you as a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. They said we are created to unto good works, to be good works. Because it was before ordained that we should walk in there. Boy, there's some stuff in here that God is seeing us in glory already. <laughs> He's looking from time now all the way into the eternity future and seeing us glorified with Him. There's some beautiful, there's some Hebraisms in here. You know, you can't just study Greek. Because a lot of times there was, especially in the book of Ephesians, we've seen a lot of Hebraism that a lot of Hebrew figures of speech that were brought into Greek. Brother Bill, did you learn something tonight from this? These these two verses that we studied tonight. Beautiful things, horrible things too. Things ought to scare the devil out of you. Well, <laughs> ought to. When you know where you're going, when you know what's taking you there, ought to scare the devil out of you. Well, that's what we're going to put for tonight. Thank you for your attention. Let's be dismissed in prayer. Brother Dave, we know you've got a procedure coming up. And it's good to see him back here. We have missed him two or three classes now. He's been really sick. Good to see him perked up enough to come to class. Is he having a personal office? Yeah, he's having one of them things. We can't even <laughs> say it, okay? We can't even say it. He don't want to make it, buddy. He's so clean, they don't need a camera, flashlight, or do it. Hey, it's not the procedure. It's before the procedure. Yeah, it's the hard part. Oh, yeah. It's, oh, the, yeah. it's the fasting that oh, was so hard. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, that's that gallon of stuff he got to drink, uh, uh, that's not so bad. They only have some some doctors don't even have to do that. So just whatever happens here. Brother Harry, it's always good to have you in here. We just dismiss us in prayer, please, brother. Thank you for all the blessings that we receive in this class, Brother James, truly blessed with the knowledge that you shared with us tonight, Father. As we go on, we just pray that we just take what we learned and just place it in our heart and share it with others, Father.